them another hand. It's always good to hear those guys. If you have your bulletins, I invite you to turn with me there and let's look at the outline and the scriptures that uh, we'll be spending some time with today. And while you're doing that, two notes uh, to the church family. Just want to extend our sympathy to the family of Betty Peebler as she passed away last Sunday and also to the family of Margaret Atkinson. Um, and both have several ties to our church family. And so we, our thoughts and prayers are with those families. And the joke is told about a minister who went to a church for a, a trial sermon. And he got up to preach his trial sermon. And it, it was a very concise, to the point, 15 minutes, done. I don't expect that here, but that's what happened in this story, all right? And so 15 minutes, the people thought, this is great. So our last guy used to just go on and on and on. And so they voted after the sermon, and they voted him in. So he was hired. Well, he was going to start the very next week. So they moved into the parsonage, he and his wife, and uh, were living there. And the very next Sunday, he came in, he preached. Sermon lasted a little over an hour, okay? And and after the sermon, he saw one of the elders, and they kind of said, we need you to come step in this room with us for a minute. And they had a discussion. said, look, you preached a 15-minute sermon on the money last week, and then this week, We didn't think it was ever going to end. Went on for an hour. What gives? He said, oh, I'm sorry. He goes, but if I'm honest with you, it's it's, the problem is your parsonage. He said, we moved in. My wife and I were trying to get ready this morning. He said, that bathroom is so small. We're just all over, you know, in each other's way trying to get ready. And he said, we both wear false teeth. He said, I accidentally put my wife's false teeth in this morning. Once you get those things going, it takes a long time (laughs) to get those things. Love you, honey. Love you. Uh, I'm an equal opportunity offender, so I'll get the guys later on, I guess. But uh, this morning, I, I want to revisit a message that I preached some time back. Uh, but every now and then when I think, what, what do we need to talk about as a church? Sometimes, I'll just tell you selfishly, I pick topics that I need to revisit. And this is one that, that I feel like I needed to go back and study on. So I want to relook at this topic today. Here's why this one weighs on me, okay? James chapter 3 says this. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. And when you are in a position of a teacher of the word, then it says you're held to a higher standard. And I know that how many times I have failed at the things we're going to talk about today and said things before I thought about them and thought, oh, I wish I could get that back. Or said things that I meant one way, but they were perceived another way. Or said things when I was emotional and wished I could get those back. Or just said things to be funny and then later thought that probably should have been not have made it through the filter uh, of a spirit-filled conscience, right? So if you feel like I'm stepping on your toes, just know this one steps on my toes too. And God's grace is here for all of us, right? But I want to share with you what the Bible says about our words that we use. And I want us to look at how important our words are, first of all. Uh, And I want us to realize how our tongue can be both used to destroy but also for great things that we're going to wrap up by looking at today and and, and the things that build up the kingdom of God as well. But uh, let's start talking, first of all, about the importance of our words. When you were a kid, you heard them say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me, right? Well, that sounds good. It makes little kids feel better when kids are mean to each other, but it's just not true, is it? Uh, words can hurt. They might not be able to physically hurt us, but they do hurt. And maybe the person that said that had never felt the sting of an insult or harsh criticism. Maybe they had never met someone who is still haunted today by stinging words from their childhood, as we talked about last week, maybe uh, verbal abuse or uh, people that, uh, maybe uh, parents that they never seem to measure up to. Maybe they still remember words from teachers or coaches who thought that their stinging criticism would motivate them, but instead really it crushed them, and they never felt that. The Bible says that our words can have powerful effects, and we'd be wise to consider that. Proverbs 18 says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. 
So I'm afraid we don't think maybe enough about the power of our words. We would be wise, the Bible says, to speak less and listen more. Uh, I, I know I struggle with that. Uh, in both of my jobs, it's all about talking, talking, talking. When you say enough in the v pure volume of words, chances are you're going to say something that you wish you could have back. Proverbs 21, 23 says, He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Are you a person that habitually, on a regular basis, says things that you wish you could have back? How many of you in the last month have said something that after you said, you were like, oh, I wish I could get that back, right? Have you all ever done that? How many of you this week have said something you wish you could get back? Yeah, and on hindsight, you know, with, with hindsight and upon reflection, you think that probably wasn't the best thing I could have said in that moment. It's been said that the Lord gave us two ears and one mouth because he knew we should listen twice as much as we speak. I don't know if that's correct or not, but a good thought nevertheless. Developing a pause button before we speak is a key, a key part of what we're talking about today. Abraham Lincoln once said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt <laughs> that you're a fool. Speaking before you think can lead us into sin, the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 10 says, When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Many people say, Ah, Greg, it's just words. But God takes our words very seriously. And we're going to look at that today. The Bible says that God will hold us accountable for our words. Matthew chapter 12 says, but I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted if you've called upon the name of Jesus, or by your words you will be condemned. We would be wise to pause and think before we speak. Now I'm preaching to myself right here. James chapter 1 verse 19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I read a story years ago about a woman who had a very serious throat condition. And the doctor told her that her vocal cords needed complete rest for six months. And so she was not to talk for six months as her throat recovered. And with a husband and six kids, this seemed impossible. But she did what she was told. When she needed someone, instead of hollering for them or speaking, she would blow a whistle. And whenever she needed to communicate with something, she would write out on paper what she needed to say. Well, after six months, she had a full recovery. Her voice came back. And when asked what it was like to communicate this way for that long of a time, she said, you'd be surprised how many notes I, I wrote out but then crumpled up and threw in the trash before anyone saw them. Because there was something about seeing what I was thinking on paper and reading it back before I gave it to them that it gave me a second chance to say, no, I don't want to say that. And I think we would be wise to develop a pause button and to consider our words, to consider the effects of our words before we just put them out there. Our words, the, the scriptures say, are an outpouring of what's in our heart. For good or for bad, conversation can be our advertisement. Every time you open your mouth, you are giving someone an insight into what's in your mind and what's in your heart. Now, I believe you can be both a spirit-filled believer, but also have some of the old flesh still in there too. And sometimes we speak before the spirit gets a chance to filter things, and, and the flesh is what comes through. And I do believe you can be a good person with, with good intentions and love the Lord, but sometimes that old flesh comes out if we don't have the pause button to stop and consider it. Luke chapter 6 says, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Anyone who's serious about being like Christ, we need to pay attention to our words. We're quick to avoid certain sins, and we would agree, well, that's, that's something you've got to stop doing. But some, how many times have we hurt people that we love with our words, and we don't realize the importance of it? 
Maybe it's husbands who have stabbed their wives with words that are as sharp as daggers and wives that have lashed out with their tongues and cut and pierced their husbands or parents that have exasperated their children with their repeated criticism and blasts of, of venom and children that have exploded at their parents with disrespectful words that, that set and hit like a bomb and churches that have had people leave because of wagging tongues and that have sliced, diced, and chopped people to shreds instead of building them up and encouraging them. Guys, our words words matter. And James chapter 1 verse 26 says, if anyone considers himself religious yet does not keep a rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. So what I'm saying in all these ways is it's important what we say. And words do matter. And we do stumble at this often. I'm putting myself up there at the lead of this pack. But I tell you what I want to do is I want to be intentional about the things I say and not as reckless. You know, one, one destructive, I want to just offer a few examples of some things that we've probably all done these at some time or another, but going forward, let's try to be intentional about avoiding some of these. One, destructive use of the tongue is gossip. The story is told of a man who started a false rumor about another man and his tribe. And they did some investigating and found out where the, the rumor started and they went and they asked that guy to come and meet with the chief. And he told him, he said, your punishment is I want you to take a feather and put it on the doorstep of every person that you told this lie to. And so he, uh, he went that night and he put all these feathers on the doorsteps of all the people that he told. And he said, and then tomorrow, more, or he came back in the morning and he said, uh, now I want you to go back to all those homes and regather those feathers and bring them back to me. And the guy said, I can't do that. He said, why not? He said, last night there was a storm, and you heard those winds blowing through here. He goes, those feathers, who knows where they are now? And the, the wise old chief said, and so it is with your words. Once you put it out there, you have no control over who they tell to who and where it ends up, and the damage is out of your control. You know, it's, it's important to think before we speak. And there's actually an acronym I shared with you a number of years ago. I'd like to share that again today because I, I think it's full of a lot of good wisdom. But it's actually the word think and the T stands for is it true. And, and is it, some people will say, well, it's not gossip. This is true. But guys, just because it's true doesn't mean it necessarily needs to be told. Um, there are things that are true about me that I wouldn't want to be advertised out there. There's shameful things I'm not proud of, and I would hope that my friends would love me enough that they're not going to go out and just broadcast that. But is it true? Certainly we don't want to forward something that's not true, for sure. H, is it helpful? Will your words help bring about a solution to the problem? And if the answer to that is no, then you have to think, well, why do I want to tell this? If it's not going to help anybody, what is my motivation in passing this on? The I stands for inspiring. Is this going to encourage somebody? Now, I might tell a story about my past if I can use it to inspire somebody else to say, hey, don't go down the road I went down. Don't make this mistake. Or I went through that, but look how I came out on top of it. And I can use, do something good by telling it. But sometimes there's no inspiration to be found in something, and it's best just left out. The N stands for, is it necessary? Now, sometimes, as Christians, the Bible says we have to talk to people about things that are tough, that we don't want to talk to them about. That's one of the least favorite parts of my job, is to confront people sometimes and have awkward conversations about things that aren't right. Uh, but as a shepherd, sometimes you have to, to do that, and it's necessary. But sometimes there's nothing to be gained and it's not necessary and it's best, again, just left out. Then the, finally, the K is for is it kind. With most things, there are two ways to go about it. If we let our emotions take control, many times if we speak before we calm down and we let the, the right spirit set in, we will come in and we will be harsh and we will rip people to shreds. But there's also a kind way that comes after prayer and reflection and letting the Spirit lead that can be to the point but can also be tactful and loving and with the best interest of the person at heart. So I encourage you to think about those things before you speak. And as your minister, I just ask you to help us protect the unity of our church. We, we talk about this in our Next Steps class, that it's not that we don't want to talk about things that are negative. It's not that we don't want to address things that need to change. But how you do that 
is so important with the right spirit and going to the people that, that can, can do something about it rather than going out into the church and talking about it on a big scale. Adding the famous phrase, I'm just telling you this so you can pray for them. That's the famous quote around churches, right? I'm just letting you know this so you can pray for them. But did you hear about da 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 right? And then whatever comes after that, it's sanctioned now because we're praying for them. But be protective of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, we've got enough people that want to talk about us out there. This needs to be a safe haven where we can come, we can share things in confidence, but we also know that we have people who love us, who have our backs, and it stays here. And we truly are praying for you, with you, and not talking about you. This needs to be a place, as we talked about last week, where there's no more condemnation for the things that are in our past. But this is a place of repentance. This is a place of healing. This is a place where God is interested in where do we go from here and we're not forever living in someone's past and beating them up over the mistakes of their past. This must be a safe place where we can come and bear our scars and say, this is who I am and I need God's help to become something different. If we think of a person's mess and their mistakes as a fire, gossip only throws more wood on the fire and it makes it harder for that person to move forward from that mistake. Proverbs 26 says this, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. And as charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Some people love to keep things stirred up. And they're, they're a danger to the church, the scriptures say. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. And they can do great damage to families, to churches, to businesses, to, to any group or unit. You know, a second destructive use of the tongue is, is criticism and harsh words. Proverbs chapter 11 says this, A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. Some of us put more stock in words than others, right? Uh, some people think it's just words, you know, and when they get upset, you're going to know it right away because everything they're thinking comes right out. It just falls right out. Every thought, every uh, emotion is going to get verbalized in that moment. And to them, they say, it's just words. And then after they get all that out, it's almost like it's therapeutic. Then they calm down and they're ready to go back to normal. But the problem is the people around them are not ready to go back to normal because other people put more value in words and they take those things that are said seriously and it's hurtful. And, and sometimes we can, can hurt people in face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, I continue to be amazed, though, at this new phenomenon. I say new over the last decade or so, I guess, of how cruel we can be online. Have you noticed this? Things that we wouldn't say to someone face-to-face but uh, holding a phone and using social media apps or typing something, you know, we will say vicious things to people. And I don't know why we feel the need to weigh in on these. I don't know how many times I have been looking at something on social media and somebody hit one of my hot buttons, right? And I just start to type in on there and I, somebody is wrong on the internet and I've got to fix them, right? And I type it all out and I get ready to hit send and I go, you know what? Nothing good is going to come from this. Nothing good. I'm not going to win this argument. They go, you know what? You're completely right. I change all my ways, and I'm going to change my whole worldview based on this. But that might be a conversation I would have face to face. But this new thing of social media, guys, many times we misrepresent the truth and the cause through the tone and the way we, we interact with people. Um, and we laugh it off and say, well, I didn't mean it. It, it, it. I was just mad. But guys, it's not just what we meant that matters. But in a conversation, when we use words, it's how our words were perceived. Perception is the reality for many people. And so we not only have to think, what did I say? What did I mean? But how did they perceive that? And how am I representing myself and Christ in that interaction we need to be careful with our words around our spouse, our children, our, our co-workers, our friends. And you can finish that for, for your life situation. But let's guard our words and, and be protective of, of others and our relationships with others, especially when we're emotional. Thirdly, uh, defective use of, uh, of our, our words is using the Lord's name disrespectfully. 
Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, we did a whole series on the Ten Commandments back in the fall, and we hit this one, and I'm not going to go into as much detail, um, but I'll just say this. It seems like throughout our society now, we have lost sight of this one. Because I hear the Lord's name used so flippantly, disrespectfully, so often in our culture. It can range from someone flippantly saying, oh my, you know, the OMG thing that we, we throw around as, as a catchphrase today. Or we use it uh, um, to, to say, I swear to, and we use God's name to make an oath, a swear. And, and God takes these things seriously whether we do or not. Or we use the name Jesus Christ as an exclamation of surprise or disgust or whatever. Ever. But to me, the most offensive one of all is when we put God's name and then we tie it to a four-letter word. And, and guys, listen, that's, that's no way for us as, as followers of Christ to, to talk. A good rule of thumb is to just not use the name of God unless you're praying to him or talking about him. Uh, and then to use it with the utmost reverence and respect. A fourth destructive use of the tongue is vulgarity. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen, there was a way that we talked in our former way of life and maybe stories and jokes and things that we told that, that we need to uh, put that part of the flesh away. And we need to find new ways to, to find humor in life and new ways to, uh, to represent ourselves to others. The scripture implies that, that such coarse talk can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And I think sometimes these things come out. It's part of that old nature, that old way of doing things. And then we realize it later. That probably didn't represent Christ the best. Uh, a fifth use that kind of goes with that is, is profanity. And I know some people say, well, Greg, using four-letter words, that's, that's technically not a sin. It's using the Lord's name in vain that's a, a sin. And I'm not here to get into that argument today. But I would argue that the use of profanity, if that's a regular part of your vocabulary, I think at best it sends a mixed message to people that we're hoping to influence for Jesus Christ. You know, hopefully we're all trying to share the gospel and be an effective witness. And when we use the language, the coarse language of the world, it doesn't represent Christ the way we would want to. Here's what Romans 14 says. Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. It's just hard for people to take you seriously as a Christian. For you to use that kind of language and then turn around and try to share the gospel with them. It just seems inconsistent in their minds. And I'm not here to get into a technical argument about is it a sin, is it not. I'm just talking about our witness and how, again, how it's perceived by people. So I would encourage you to, to consider that uh, in your life if that's a normal part of your vocabulary. A sixth destructive use is negativity. Now listen, I can be as guilty of this one as anybody. The, the jokes told about a, a monk, I've shared this with you sometime before, but they, they went into this monastery and they had to take a vow of silence. And the rule was that you're only allowed two words a year. So you use them wisely. So for the whole year, they just lived in silence, and so they, at the end of the year, they got to appear before the head monk, the abbot, and uh, speak their two words. And so uh, the first year, the, the monk said, food bad. And so that was, it was recorded, you know, he doesn't like the food here. So the second year went by. He didn't say a whole word. To the end of the year, he got his two words, and he said, bed hard. So they noted that and wrote it down. The third year went by. He reported, and he said, I quit. And the, the abbot said, well, good, all you've done is complain since you've been here. So <laughs> sometimes negativity is all that people see come out of us. But, but seriously, we all know people who, who are negative. Whenever you're around them, you know this is going to be something negative. If you don't know those people, I'm just saying maybe it's you, right, <laughs> that you're the person. And, and aren't, aren't they a drag? I catch myself getting in these negative cycles where I just... All I can think about are the things that are bugging me, and if you're around me, you're going to hear about it, and I'm going to dwell on it, I'm going to talk about it, and I am sure nobody wants to be around me on those days. You know better than to ask them how they're doing, because that's going to lead to another 20 minutes of, well, my eyelids hurt, and you know, they're going on telling you everything that, that's wrong. And, you know, 
it's been my experience. And when I have my rational moments where I'm thinking clearly, I remind myself of this. You usually find in life what you're looking for. If you get out of bed every day just expecting something to be wrong, something to be negative, it won't take long. You'll find it because there's negative in every day. But uh, you also can look for the good in every day and say, you know what, I'm going to look for the blessings today. And that's what I'm going to focus on. That's what I'm going to talk about. And you'll find that your day goes differently. Proverbs 23 says, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. And so our attitude each day, and here, here's what our goal should be. At the end of the day, have we reminded anybody of what it must have been like to be around Jesus? I just... I don't know this. I can't give you a scripture that, that comes to mind right now to say this is absolutely true. But I just feel like from what I know about Jesus from scripture, that he was so encouraging to be around. That you always just felt as long as Jesus is around, there's hope. You know, there's a reason to be happy. There's a reason to be joyful. And I know that I may have some problems, but Jesus is going to set me free from this. And there's, there's a good future and I want to be that way around people. I don't want to drag everybody down that I'm around. And I was having a good day. I hung out with Greg, and I realized how bad everything is, right? But Philippians 2, 5 says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And it talked about how he came to be a, a servant and to serve and to love people. But I just every day want to think, Am I? is my attitude today, is it the way Jesus' attitude would be? Or is it? become stinky and I'm just messing everybody's day up around me and maybe we need to refocus and catch yourself okay I want to close today by talking about just a few quick things that are good things that if we're intentional about not doing those things and trying to catch ourselves when we're starting to gossip or we're being negative or whatever you know all those things then here's some things that we need to try to say God help me to do this this week more of this please one use your words for encouragement encouragement do you know people on the flip side of what we just talked about who every time you're around them, you just come away feeling so good, right? John Kessel. I mean, does everybody feel good when you talk to John? To hear him tell it, I am the best preacher ever. I love John, right? He makes me feel so good and encouraged and he just has that gift and I just don't think you can hang around him all day and have a bad day. But they're just focused on the positive. They see the best in people. They're upbeat and energetic and often complimentary of, of, of you and others and they pick you up. And listen, as Christians, that's the kind of person we ought to be. Uh, people should be drawn to us. And they want to know, why are you always so optimistic? Why are you so upbeat? Why do you have so much joy in your life? In a world that's so often filled with negativity and criticism and, and ugliness, be the person who's so refreshingly positive and encouraging and optimistic and uplifting. I want to be that person. I don't think I'm there yet. But I'm determined that's who I want to be and that's who I want to become. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Don't underestimate the power of a sincere word of encouragement. That might be just what somebody needs at that moment. I can't tell you how much the words of encouragement that you all offer me mean to me. And sometimes it can be a, a rough week, and I think, man, I'm not feeling this message this week. I don't think it's going to be any good. And somebody will stop out the, at the, in the lobby and say, man, that message is just what I needed to hear. And I'm like, well, thank you, Lord, you know. And it just makes all the difference, and you feel like it wasn't all for nothing. Or you just tell somebody, man, you're doing such a great job at that. And just, or you look great today. Make sure it's appropriate how you tell them that, right? But just share those encouraging words in people's lives. And I don't care whether you're 9 years old or you're 99 years old. That never gets old, does it? To hear that, hey, you did that well. Or I admire you for this characteristic or this trait in your life. Um, secondly, I encourage you to use your words for prayer. 1 John chapter 5 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask, I, I have this underlined, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay? The more we get in the word and understand his will, pray that. Pray his will. Okay, And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So when we get in the word and we understand the will of God and we pray the will of God, then that, our prayers have power. Why don't we do that more? I wonder how many things in our life could be different if we just prayed more. 
if we just took God at his word and prayed the promises of God back to him. Prayer is the means through which we access the promises and the power of God. If you think about it, why does God tell us to pray? Have you ever just asked yourself, because God already knows everything. He knows what you need. He knows what you're worried about. He knows your hang-ups. He knows everything before you could even say it. But yet he says, I want you to pray to me. I believe it's because there's something about voicing it that speaks it and invites God to intervene. God doesn't force himself into many of the situations of our life. He's waiting to be invited to come into your marriage, to come into your parent-child relationships, to come into your finances. To, but listen, if you invite him in, you got to let him have control. You don't say, God, I want you to do this my way and fix it. You say, God, come be the Lord over this. Come be the Lord over my marriage, over my children, over my finances, my job. Invite him in and do more of that in your life. And I think you'll see a huge difference in your attitude and in the outcomes of your life. One of the best things we can do with our voice is to call out to God in faith and in prayer. Thirdly, use your words for praise. Psalm 71 says, my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Guys, when you boil it all down, that's what we were created for, is to praise and glorify God. And when we get away from that, we're getting away from our purpose, to bring God glory and praise. First of all, God loves it when we praise him. When, when we are gathered here for worship and we all in one accord, one voice, are declaring and giving glory to God, then I just think it, it just, he says, yes, 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 I love that. But not only does it glorify God, but it sets your mind in the right place. Listen, it's hard to complain and worship at the same time, right? When you come in and you set all the worries aside and, then, and all that and you just focus on God, suddenly your day gets better. I, I've had weeks where I struggled to get my old bones here today and have anything you know, to, to good to say to you. But something happens when I worship Something happens when I come around this table and I remember what he's done for me and I'm reminded of his promises as we look at his word and I often come away from this place different because I use my voice to praise him in the midst of whatever I'm in at that time. Secondly, uh, let, let's close today by just using our voices for that very thing. Now, here's an old song that I, when I'm just at home and I just want to sing something to God and if I'm just me and God in the truck or whatever, Sometimes I'll just, this is one of my favorite ones, just to, to use my voice to praise him. If you know it, sing it with me. It says, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Let's pray. God, I pray that of all the things that we could do with the voice that you've given us, I pray that we'll use it for that the most. To tell of the things that you've done in our life, to tell your story, to share the gospel, God. One of the most important things we could do is share the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. God, I just come today um, asking personally for you to forgive me for the times that I've missed the mark and I've used my words for things that didn't build you up. They were too much about me, about the flesh, and not enough led by the Spirit. God, I pray that you'll help me to uh, be intentional going forward about living and speaking the way that I need to speak in all my interactions, God, so that I give you glory. God, if there's somebody here today that has never used their voice for the most important thing that we could ever say in life, and we say it here often, and it's that I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and I want him to be my savior I want what he did on the cross to be the payment of my sins for my sins so God I invite you in to come in and be the Lord of my life I want to repent of all the things of the flesh that I used to live for and I want you to come be the boss of me 
I want you to come and direct and guide my life. I invite you in to, to all those things we talked about, my marriage, my finances, my job, my, my hobbies, and everything, God. You're the Lord. If there's somebody here that's never used their voice for that, God, I pray that this moment will be the moment they, they say the most important things they've ever said in their life by making Jesus the Lord of their life. Father, thank you for giving us voices to speak. May we use them to tell your story, to praise your name, to pray and claim your promises and to see your kingdom come in this church, in this community, and throughout this world, God, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, those words that I shared can be the words of eternal life that you could come and speak and use your voice to do what your voice was created to do, to give glory to Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to rededicate your life and you're just at a turning point and you feel it. The Spirit is saying, we need to drive down a stake and I want to rededicate my life. I want to get back to where I know I need to be living. This is a church family that will pray for you and encourage you, help hold you accountable to that decision. There's something about making it public that helps us follow through. If you have a prayer need, there's somebody that will be waiting for you right through those curtains to my left, your right, that will love to pray with you and, and uh, lift a burden up for you today. Okay? If you're interested in becoming a member of this church, we had a couple join in the first service this morning. We'd love to start that process with you today. But let's stand together and just obey the Spirit.